I'm sure other people will join us as we as we start. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give you a, a short overview of how we are going to run this session. So because maybe it wasn't exactly clear from our from our flyer or the information that's on Attendify. So first we're going to have a, a keynote from Karen Baker and she is a professor and research chair and co-director of the program on water governance at UBC. Um, she's spent 20 years conducting interdisciplinary research on water and environmental govern governance. And so she's going to sort of set the stage for us with, um, with providing some background on why we think that this session is important, why we need new forms of data, why we need better data integration, and how this can inform decision-making around water-related issues and SDG 6. Then we're going to have a series of flash presentations, and I'll identify the flash presenters after Karen's presentation. And so each one of these presentations is going to be very quick and we're not going to break for discussion at that time. So they're just sort of, again, trying to set the stage for what's out there, what's being done in order to improve uh, our understanding of water using sort of new technologies and new data. And then after that, we'll have, we'll have a panel discussion. And so once we go to the panel discussion, then this is when we will open up for discussion. Um, and we will take, I will be monitoring the chat. And so if you have any questions for anyone, then we will be looking at those during the, the panel discussion. So we won't actually have a discussion until sort of the, that point in the agenda. So I hope that that is clear. And so I will now hand over to, to Karen to get started. Thanks so much, Jillian, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I look forward to hearing everyone's questions and comments. So as Jillian mentioned, I'll give a presentation that will kick us off and I'm going to share my screen and it'd be great to get feedback as to whether people can see my presentation. You should see it and it's titled Digital Water. Can people see yep. it? Great. We can. Great. So, let me begin by noting that many of the remarks I'll make today are not unique to water. We are currently living in a very interesting time when the acceleration of digital technologies is leading to a revolution in environmental governance. And this revolution is affecting not only environmental monitoring, but also enforcement. And all of this is predicated on an abundance, a superabundance of environmental data. Now, this contradicts a major barrier to effective environmental and water governance in the past, which was a scarcity of data. Most of you will have worked in positions where you're very familiar with this problem. There's not enough data, or if the data is available, it's available too late. There is a time lag. And hence, uh, we are either unable to engage in effective management, conservation, and protection, or um, we are really playing a, a post hoc, an after the fact game. What we are now moving to is a very different style of environmental governance enabled by digital earth technologies that will address these issues. Rather than a scarcity of data, we have an abundance of data. Rather than a lag time, we are able to access that data in near real time. Now, why is this the case? This is the case because over the past 10 years, a number of developments have occurred on the hardware and the software side. On the hardware side, we have the prolifer pr proliferation of Internet of Things technology. So you can imagine this a lot like smart cities but applied to the environment. So we have Fitbits for endangered species. We have, uh, in, in, fa in fact, aquatic Fitbits for the oceans. We have sensors that we can apply to everything from honeybees to butterflies to endangered tigers. And indeed, many conservationists are applying sensors in the most remote environments from the Arctic to the Antarctic. And with the advent of this inexpensive instrumentation, we are interconnecting a, 
a number of geographies and species uh, in real time, thanks, of course, to uh, satellite technology and the rapidly decreasing cost of cloud-based computing. So that's instrumentation and interconnectedness. Now, in and of themselves, those are not new, although the technologies are much cheaper and more prevalent than in the past. But the third element is, of course, artificial intelligence, and that is the application of technologies such as machine learning or computer vision to the analysis of the large amounts of data, the, the exponentially larger amounts of data that are now being generated from ecosystems around the world. This in turn enables continuous monitoring, spatially and temporally ubiquitous data with, as I mentioned, some very interesting applications. I'll just mention a few before I dive into water related examples. So environmental monitoring is moving forward by leaps and bounds. Uh, I'm, some of you may have seen the recent headline in Nature, uh, the, the scientific journal this week, uh, that discussed a new development which allows scientists to map and catalog every tree, unique individual tree on earth. Uh, we are able to do something very similar with species. So there's a number of applications. My uh, favorite is called Wild Book. It's uh, the wildlife equivalent to Facebook. This uses the equivalent of computer vision, facial recognition technology applied to non-human species to not only enumerate or, or identify them, but to identify individuals within those species. So these are profoundly transformative technologies that are leading to rapid advances in conservation, particularly of endangered species. So for example, there's some very promising developments with respect to the use of predictive algorithms that are actually quite similar to and were adapted from the predictive algorithms used to spot terrorists in airports, but in this case applied to predict and prevent poachers in conservation areas and national parks. Another interesting development in conservation is the emergence of so-called mobile protected areas. Um, in the 20th century, many parks and protected areas were created. These had fixed boundaries and now with a computationally intensive management regime, they can be mobile. So we have mobile protected areas that, for example, follow endangered bluefin tuna as they move across the Pacific Ocean through the Great Australian Bight, which means that the rules that are enforced about tuna fishing um, change daily, spatially and temporally across the ocean surface. This is fascinating developments in conservation. And of course, last but not least, all of these technologies enable us to do a much better job at hazard prediction, mitigation and response. And some of you may have followed the very interesting use of real-time satellite data in the recent fires um, in the United States. And a similar set of technologies is emerging with respect to floods. Our ability to do this will be greatly enhanced um, in the near future with innovative startups like Planet, which is based in San Francisco, now promising that we will be able to Google the surface of the earth in real time, much like we Google data archives or photo or videos online right now. And the, the, the potential, uh, both bad and good, in terms of eco surveillance, um, human bycatch, privacy issues, as well as the potential for environmental monitoring, protection and management is of course enormous. What does this mean for water? Well, as I mentioned, it means an enormous surge in the amount of data available. This is one example, this is IBM that's collaborating with Rensselaer University at One Lake in the United States. They were doing on the order of a few hundred observations per year, and now they're doing um, several million uh, with multiple sensing platforms. And with this, one begins to develop um, a comprehensive understanding of um, biochemical uh, processes uh, and lake morphology that was simply not available in a pre-digital world. Another example I like is this one. This is river track. Um, rivers that are likely to flood are fitted with sensors on bridges or structures above the water level. And then residents are alerted of rising water levels uh, by radio. Uh, so these enable more flood resilience at very low cost. 
Here's another example, smart riverbanks and augmented reality. So augmented reality is, is like a form of virtual reality, but it occurs in nature. That is, you might be wearing a, a headset or using or looking through your phone, but uh, you're seeing um, digitally uh, transposed or projected elements over a real landscape, a bit like Pokemon Go, if any of you ever played that with your kids. Here in this case, cameras are installed along key points adjacent to riverbanks using IoT technology. There's a dynamic GIS layer. And what this does is it saves valuable time and resources manually collecting and analyzing data and provides a very valuable um, alternative to in-person monitoring. Now, all of these examples by themselves might seem quirky or trivial, but there are thousands of examples like this that are proliferating. Uh, and once you do so, you create uh, a, 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 somewhat like a green panopticon, right? um, a global system that is harvesting enormous amounts of environmental data and is mobilizing that for uh, protection, conservation, flood protection, and uh, prevention and other purposes. Now, proponents of this, supporters of this are very keen on all the benefits. Of course, there are potential risks. And in the remaining part of the presentation, I will simply outline these risks. And I think that will be a good stepping stone for our discussions. Digital earth governance is technically challenging. There's a huge amount of raw data to be transmitted and local data processing is very challenging. And, and so uh, computer scientists will tell you uh, and engineers that the development of new coordination and communication protocols for these sensor networks and the algorithms required for data querying, these are non-trivial problems. We haven't solved them all yet. What's particularly challenging is when we attempt to integrate data across different types of sensor networks and different types of ecosystems. And here I've given an example of the distinct needs that arise from, on the one hand, disciplines like meteorology and oceanography, which take a web of flows approach, versus wildlife and biology and ecology, a web of life approach. So different sorts of um, grids for connecting data, for example, are applicable in these different dis disciplines. And we have not yet created the, the metadata protocols and management that we need uh, in order to do this effectively. Finally, there's a hardware issue with redundancy, security, cost, quality control of sensors. So I, I think we're still at the beginning, this is still in its infancy, technically. Nonetheless, we can look forward to a time when we've addressed some of those technical challenges. And we do have a situation where we have an enormous amount of data on our hands. This poses a separate set of questions, notably about the global governance of environmental data. Jillian has done work on this, David Jensen as well, her colleague at UNEP. The need for an international framework uh, for the coordination of environmental data and particularly norms and safeguards around intellectual property is very key. And this is particularly the case as more and more actors will seek to use near real time information for dynamic uh, or adaptive management. Some of you may have been following the debates about using remote sensing data, for example, to issue fines to greenhouse gas emitters in real time and also to trace emissions that are um, fugitive uh, or, or, or not recorded, right? So this is, this is scaling up global enforcement in a very active way. And you can imagine something very similar, of course, for water polluters. So the debate here is around the degree to which we need a global framework for transparency on environmental data that expands access to data from both public and private sources of course, this would need to be combined with some sort of robust traceability mechanism and distributed letter technology is often cited as, as one of our best possibilities. Although I think the issues there are far from resolved. The final issue, and I know we'll speak about citizen science later, is with respect to the growing involvement of non-state actors. Many of the, the, the apps, um, I have a, a database of over 4,000 of these technologies that are being used. Many of them are meant to be used primarily by citizens through smartphones and social media, enabling citizen-led monitoring and enforcement action. So this moves enforcement and monitoring beyond the purview of states, which poses other issues. So this is the last set of points I'll mention a set of very, very profound ethical challenges uh, to do with uh, exploitative modes of recruitment. Um, we already have very significant debates about smart city technology. And to this, we must add debates about smart earth technology. Do we voluntarily submit to surveillance? What about human bycatch? 
um, privacy issues are very important. The potential for bias and automated algorithms that might support from our, some of our decision-making frameworks is obviously high. Uh, you're all familiar with some of the bias issues related to, for example, race or gender in automated algorithms, uh, for example, in HR tech um, or social media. There are similar issues here and of great concern, particularly when we're thinking of, of trade-offs between different types of ecosystem services or different species within ecosystems that don't always have the same needs. <laughs> Finally, there are enormous environmental impacts and um, energy demands. Um, the digital sector is responsible for a huge amount of energy uh, use and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if the global internet were a country, it would be the third largest emitter worldwide. And of course, the proliferation of all of these devices creates a huge e-waste issue. Although I think the advent of biological computing and biodegradable components is around the corner, at least in the short term, this is a very, very significant issue. So we have before us, just to conclude, uh, an amazing vista, right? Where, where the digitization of water and environmental monitoring creates new possibilities for water and environmental governance in a wider world we could become exponentially better at detecting pollution, at preventing poaching, at mitigating floods and hazards. I do believe we should be pursuing these possibilities as they will accelerate our ability to achieve the SDGs. However, I do have very serious concerns uh, in terms of hardware, <laughs> regulation and governance and ethics. And I think we must be mindful of these uh, knowing full well the broader pitfalls that the digital big tech sector has fallen into. So I look forward to discussion on both the possibilities uh, and the potential pitfalls of these new technologies, um, particularly with respect to environmental data and water data management. Thank so you, with Karen. that, yeah, I'll conclude and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Karen, for the presentation. So we're now gonna move on to the flash presentations. And I realized at the beginning of this um, that I did not thank the amazing co-organizers that put this together. Um, as you can see from the agenda, we have, you know, we, we have a lot of different sectors involved and we, and we tried to bring in some really great examples. And so I should have mentioned that without Gallup um, and the WMO and the Office for National Statistics in the UK, the Data Science Campus part of that, then there's no way that we could have pulled this together. And all of the people involved um, contributed greatly to how we fleshed out this agenda. So I just wanted to thank everyone involved and again, thank everyone for coming to, to listen to this session. So now moving on to the flash presentations. Um, I'll quickly give you just a flavor of the people that we have involved. So first we have, um, in no particular order, actually. We have Alistair Edwards, who is a spatial data scientist who was working at the ONS. He has now moved on to DEFRA in the UK, um, but he was working at the data science campus in the US uh, when we put this proposal together. And he leads research related to geospatial techniques and data sor sources and environmental and public and social policy. And um, he also was very involved in some of the work that we did around SDG6 when I was with UNEP. Um, and so I, I believe he'll be telling you some of that. The work that he did was with, uh, has also involved Luca de Felice, who is a geospatial data science at the European Union's Joint Research Center or the EC's Joint Research Center. Um, and so Luca and Alistair are going to sort of share a flash presentation and, and give a, a little perspective on the work around SDG 661, which is the change in freshwater related ecosystems over time. Um, and so then we also have uh, Maria Rosa Mandanari. Mon I'm sorry, I'm not positive how to say your last name. Um, and she goes by Rosie, and she's the managing director of the Citizen Science Center in Zurich. And so Rosie's been working around different citizen science issues for quite a long time. Before she joined the Citizen Science Center in, in Zurich, she was involved in the Citizen Cyber Lab, which was a partnership of CERN, UNITAR, and the University of Geneva. Um, and she's also worked as an associate director at the World Economic Forum. And so she's going to be talking to us about some of the citizen science applications related to, to water. 
um, and water quality. And then we have Sarah Young, who uh, is going to be talking to us about, again, some of the more human health impacts. And so Sarah is an associate professor of anthropology and global health at Northwestern University. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about some of the work that they're doing to do cross-culturally equivalent measurement of water access and use. So this is the this is sort of excellent flash presentations that we have. Um, and I, I wanna tell the panelists that I'm going to keep a timer. So monitor the chat to make sure that you are able to, to see when I'm telling you that you're running out of time. And so with that, I'll hand over to Rosie for a 10 minute presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to share this uh, short introduction about uh, citizen science uh, and the potential to provide valuable data for the SDGs. So I work in the Citizen Science Center in Zurich. Very quickly, this is a joint initiative of the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. And the idea is to promote and support the implementation of citizen science projects at the two institutions in Switzerland and beyond. So let's start with the definition of citizen science. If you look in the literature or on the web, you find several definitions. The first one here is from the Oxford Dictionary and defines citizen science as a scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration or under the direction of professional scientists. Um, the second one uh, I like as well is a little bit more pragmatic and defines citizen science as a broad range of activities where people produce scientific knowledge outside of traditional scientific institutions. Uh, again, if you look at the web, you will find uh, many more of them. They all have some aspects in common. And these are, first of all, uh, the participation of the general public. The second one is that they participate on the voluntary basis, so voluntary contribution. And then the idea is to produce science-based knowledge. And I put science-based in parentheses here, and I highlighted often in the definition of the Oxford Dictionary, because it's not always that in these projects, scientists are involved at the same level, at the same degree. Um, even though I believe, and in Zurich, we really believe that the participation of scientists is what makes uh, citizen science different from other form of uh, citizen-generated data. Uh, just again, to be clear, we are talking about those projects where, for instance, hundreds of thousands of people may contribute images of insects or birds or plants, but also projects where you have a very small group of passionate people that look at satellite images to monitor deforestation or that help historians to look for the tomb on Genghis Khan. So really every kind of scientific domain, the arts, the humanities, and also social. So why citizen science for the SDGs? We um, do believe that citizen science can help uh, with some uh, fundamental issue that um, basically are at the base of the uh, data gaps or unavailability of data for the SDGs, despite what Karen just said now, I mean, there are really a lot of data, but then another issue is really, um, you know, making sense and looking at this data. Uh, and in particular, uh, we think that citizen science can help uh, uh, in the dimension, you know, space and time resolution, the issues of transparency and accuracy, and also for the benefits and the effects on education and behavior of people. And actually, let me start from this one. Um, it has been demonstrated in several studies that hands-on activities uh, are extremely effective in terms of education or knowledge about the, the specific uh, you know, topic and aspect that uh, is under study. And this also generates uh, some kind of uh, sense of ownership of the problem in people that participate uh, that in turn uh, translates 
ultimately in, in, uh, in a change of behavior of people. The aspect of transparency is the citizen science projects usually involve you know, many people, many stakeholders, and the processes, the, um, the data, the way you, you handle and the way you analyze your data are most of the time open and very transparent which is something that cannot always be said for data sets provided by governments. Uh, about uh, the spatial and temporal resolutions, I mean, the dimensions, both of them have, uh, you know, the roots in the cost. So if you look at the traditional data sources like censuses or, you know, surveys or even traditional monitoring stations, they are quite expensive. So they can be actually a barrier for countries to monitor and assess progresses, especially for developing countries. So, and we think that citizen science can help, especially in these two aspects. Why? Because in theory, by definition, the idea is that potentially everybody out there with a smartphone or with a you know, cheap do-it-yourself kit can provide data for you. And this means that you have a great spatial resolution and you know, observation, dense observation and data. These data coming from these devices are most of the time geolocated. So you may have a picture of a certain, you know, um, again, image or biodiversity with, which is geolocated. And another aspect is that more data can be provided because citizens live almost everywhere and they like to travel everywhere. Uh, so you have data for places from places where maybe you know officials from government cannot really go. For time uh, issues again, the cost means that uh, that some of the data taking is infrequent, uh, and that means in turn that is quickly outdated. While in citizen science projects, uh, you actually have projects that run basically an ongoing basis. You have projects that run with the high frequency of data collections or you have projects that maybe do a data collection once a year, but then you know, they've been alive since 1994. For instance, the, one example is this um, Seki DPIN, which is uh, um, basically uh, measuring turbidity in water once per year since 1994. One word on data quality, because this is always the first question, and this is still probably the main barrier to adoption. Um, however, there are many studies and there are peer reviewed papers that have shown that the quality of citizens contribution is equal to the one of professional scientists. Why? Because the methodology has the same level of accuracy as traditional methods. And here again, I want to go back. Of course, this is true only if you do things in the correct way. But this is, you know, is true for, for everything, for every process. And here for me, again, the presence of scientists in these activities is what somehow guarantee um, the level of quality of the data. So this is already happening. Citizen science is already contributing to the monitoring of five SDG indicators, potentially can contribute to seven, six additional indicators. And all of these mainly um, is happening in, in, uh, in the goals and in the domain that have to do with environment, biodiversity, conservation, even though citizen science is getting stronger and stronger, for instance, in, in issues related to health and well-being. So I will just uh, finish up with a couple of uh, very concrete examples. One is, for instance, indicator 6.3.2. So this is water quality, which is a typical example of a measurement where you know, the spatial and temporal resolutions are key, but means that you need a lot of uh, you know, financial and human resources. So how can citizens help? They can do, for instance, hydrological monitoring. They can measure you know, the, the reserve of water in, in lakes or in rivers. Uh, they do quality um, quality tests, and uh, thanks to these uh, kits uh, that exist, uh, they can measure temperature, they can measure you know turbidity, conductivities, and many other parameters. 
uh, they can uh, um, give information about the presence of pollution sources, for instance, you know, facilities for wastewater. And also, and actually increasingly, they are used to basically improve or calibrate or ground truth uh, the information that you can get from satellite data about water quality or wetla wetland extension. Uh, just one example very famous is Freshwater Wash. Uh, this is a database uh, of, um, of uh, water quality data that cover in a regular base more than 2,500 water bodies all over the place uh, with more than 8,000 participants. Um, a second example, and I'm sorry about the, the background noise, uh, the second example is 14.1.1. Um, this is another um, you know, difficult indicator, uh, eutrophication and uh, you know, plastic debris density. So again, citizen science can help in multiple ways. One is to provide data, quantify the debris, the extent of the source, uh, and see which are the ways of releasing to the environment. But at the same time, people doing this job, they actually pick up the debris and they do uh, cleanups. And this increases awareness. And the awareness basically promotes behavioral change. And then ultimately, all of these can influence policy, especially at the local level. Um, very well-known example is the, the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. Uh, you can just look at some of the numbers here, are pretty impressive. This is a network of more than a thousand organizations that are doing this job and about uh, almost 200,000 volunteers all over Australia. Another example is this one in uh, eutrophication. And by the way, UN Environment recommends in this case to combine uh, the use of sensing with um, citizen science for, for monitoring. And, um, and this project in particular it uses an app to look at the, at the color of seawater and so have a basically a baseline simple indicator about the transparency and fluorescence and which are um, indicators of eutrophic trends. So I will stop here with the main takeaway for you. I hope I stimulate at least your curiosity to learn more about this. But the idea is that citizen science cannot substitute official data, but can complement and improve the SDG reporting process, especially for um, projects and data uh, which are uh, related to water measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie. So I will now hand over to Alistair and Luca, who will be giving a joint uh, intervention presentation um, with a video. So over to you. Thank you, Gianna. Let me share my screen and we can start. As a morphous and intricate system, water is a complex ecosystem to measure, particularly at the rate and scale required to monitor sustainable development goals. As a result, national reporting um, has had a slow uptake. In 2018, only around 20% of member states were returning data, and this was of variable quality. To rise to the challenge of filling these data gaps, we must make use of tools and methods of the digital and data age, such as technologies for big data and data science. In this talk, we will look at the potential of such developments, particularly in terms of Earth observation data. Luca from the Joint Research Centre will first describe work they've done to harness big data platforms to produce global data sets for SDG 6.6.1. I'll then follow to describe some of the ways in which we at the ONS Data Science Campus have been researching new ways data science can complement this activity. We know that it's still difficult to obtain data from countries that the level of quality and quantity required to efficiently report against these indicators. One innovative way of addressing this issue is to use Earth observation. Earth observation data, which is gathered by satellites, 
airborne devices, drones, and ground-based sensors helps us to track global change in high resolution real time, provides data continuity and long time series, it enables regular monitoring and delivers information for decision making, and can significantly reduce the costs of monitoring progress towards SDGs. It can also help develop more detailed indicators without requiring any additional reporting by countries. Data from Earth Observation Program has been growing exponentially for years. Think, for example, that the European Copernicus program releases on average 8 petabytes of data per year. So, Earth observation data analytics is a key need. And the free and open access to Earth observation data has been offered by space agencies such as ESA and NASA for more than 10 years. Likewise, there has been a recent increase in the proliferation of cloud computing services focused on satellite observations with big data analytical capabilities. The intention is to encourage the use of such data in continuously monitoring the SDGs and reporting on progress of all member countries, thereby supporting the principle of leave no one behind. This is how Earth observations, geospatial information and big data are increasingly playing a major role in the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Goals at national, regional and local levels. It's estimated that 40% of the indicators that make up all SDGs can be developed thanks to space-based technology and science. Earth observation, for instance, is used for monitoring freshwater ecosystems by depicting the extent of change in water-related ecosystems over time. We know that our water resources change all the time and that the joint research center of the European Commission where I work, scientists were able to create a sort of time machine using satellite images in order to catch the dynamic aspect of surface water on the planet. Working in collaboration with Google Earth Engine, we analyzed over 4 million satellite images taken between 1984 and 2019 to create the Global Surface Water Explorer, which captures the changes in surface water resources over the past 36 years across the entire planet. Creating that time machine was a big, big computational task. If we had only had one computer to do it, we'd have had to switch on that computer when Charlemagne conquered Saxon in 804 leave it running 24 hours a day, 7 days a week until about today to complete this task. Fortunately, thanks to Google Earth Engine's powerful computing capacity, we were able to run our system on 10,000 computers. So we were able to turn all those satellite images into a unique set of maps, which now also include that. Since it's digital, we can actually turn that into maps of change. For example, in this map, the black areas show where there has been no change over the first 36 years. The red is where it used to be water, now it's land, and the green is where it used to be land, and now it's water. Exactly using datasets like Global Surface Water Explorer, UNEP, in partnership with Google and the JSC, developed the Freshwater Ecosystems Explorer, which actually uses Earth observation to visualize and represent the extent to which freshwater ecosystems change over time. The data on the platform is intended to drive action to protect and restore freshwater ecosystems. The user can select the country of interest and the dashboard of national level statistics will appear. Data is available for a range of freshwater ecosystem types. Permanent water, seasonal water, water contained in artificial water bodies, mangroves, wetlands, and water quality. Data indicates whether change has increased or decreased since measurements began. It's possible to switch on all maps to observe all types of freshwater ecosystems. It's also available in advanced analysis for each of the sub-indicator datasets. Data for every country is also available at sub-national level either at subnational administrative level or for a particular base in size, and all data can be downloaded. Following on from the fantastic work that Luke has presented, where might we go next? Advances in modeling, such as um, deep learning using a neural network, can help improve the detection of water bodies and their condition, for example, to complement the freshwater explorer with more timely data. 
deep learning can integrate a variety of different inputs from, from different imagery sources. As well as using the measured values at any particular location, models can use information from neighboring locations in space and time to improve their predictions. This can help deep learning models to be more robust to a wide range of different conditions and settings when classifying water bodies. However, deep learning models need to make use of large volumes of training data. Increasingly, we're seeing open source libraries of such training data, and this will be critical to the further uptake of such methods. An example that we've made use of is shown here from the SEN12MS project. Once models have been trained, um, they can be shared to support others in developing machine learning based solutions. This can also be further refined um, to particular locations with more local or more up to date training data. Through the process of transfer learning, models that have been trained against quite different data sources, for example, lower resolution data or more conventional images, can actually be used as the basis for new models. The flexibility of modular components for cloud computing can be employed to build pipelines that process data through such models um, and then present it immediately. This means that the most timely data um, uh, to support the needs of, of everyday decision making can be provided on demand. Here I show an example of a pipeline that we built at the campus. This classifies water from the most recent um, imagery available using only interaction through a browser that's talking to a, a set of services that we've built in the cloud. We can go further than just presenting the classified data. So using modeling methods such as long short term memory networks, we can detect changes in the water that are unusual. We can use this information then to guide sort of drilling down into affected areas uh, using um, very high resolution satellite data that's more costly, such as this information, this data here from, from Planet. Open source tools for presenting and visualizing data are also providing compelling ways of making data more discoverable and accessible. We've jointly developed the Open SDG platform to enable national data on SDGs to be easily identified um, and presented together with metadata and links to methodology. Um, within this tool, we can embed um, interactive data visualizations. So for example, um, here using the open source toolkit um, Vega, and this allows data to become more um, engaging and, and accessible. This has just been a very brief tour of a few of uh, a few examples of what's possible using new big data and, and data science approaches. We thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone. Juliana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation um, and, you know, and for preparing it ahead of time so that, it, of course, it's very smooth. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to our last flash presentation, which is Sarah Young. Um, so over to you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and in the next nine minutes or so, I promise. I'll be talking about um, our work on benchmarking water and security experiences globally. Um, I'll start by talking about why and how we're measuring um, water and security experiences. I'll then move on to the global implementation of this by Gallup World Polls. And then I'll wrap up with some opportunities and challenges for uh, research and policy. So it's a platitude that water is life, but it's a good reminder that it's water that distinguishes us from anywhere in the universe. And it's integral to our well-being and even happiness such that it shapes our lives in countless ways. There's the obvious drinking, but laundry and food production, preparation, washing ourselves and our grubby little kids, it's all part of it. Uh, but I actually didn't think too much about water until I was starting a study in Western Kenya in 2013. And it was a study on um, food insecurity and maternal and child health. <clears throat> and as it turned out, uh, water shaped people's lives, preliminary data showed us that water shaped people's lives as much, if not more so than food. And so I wondered, could we quantify these experiences with water and security? It turns out food insecurity experiences are easily quantified and they're the basis of an SDG indicator. Those of you who saw this recent report 
of the state of food security saw that food insecurity was prominent and an important indicator for, for much policy and research. So in my naive self, turned to the water literature. And what I learned is that water security is kind of quantified in, in or considered in, in four domains. So there's the availability, that's the physical availability. Is it there to touch? And if it's there to touch, can I actually touch it? Can I physically get there, economically afford it? And if I can access it, is it acceptable and safe for use both for consuming and non-ingestive uses? And are those stable over time? So looking further, I found we could measure some of these aspects. And you saw from some of my colleagues earlier presentations, physical availability is, is there's a lot of ways of measuring that. Satellite data, hydrological indicators. Um, the physical accessibility of drinking water is, just for drinking is an SDG indicator right now. And there are many ways of measuring safety microbially, chemically, and so on. But I was thinking about these experiences of women in Kenya. And as it turns out, there wasn't a way of measuring those experiences that was globally comparable. <clears throat> and this is really important because measurements, for example, of availability can really obscure the heterogeneity in access and use. I mean, that can vary by household, it can vary by neighborhood, it can vary by state. Um, so this need for better data on water was, was echoed elsewhere. In 2018, there was a high level panel report with the launch of the water action decade that said, you can't measure, you can't manage what you can't measure, but major gaps exist. And um, we need to get higher resolution data on water. So you were with me in Kenya in 2013. We're fast forwarding now to 2017 in Evanston. I, and what I did was I brought 30 of my closest colleagues, well, that might be a stretch, but colleagues from many countries and many disciplines. And we launched what we call the Household Water and Security Experiences Survey. This QR code will show up in a couple of slides and you can see more about this work there. Um, just ever so briefly, we implemented this survey in 28 sites across 8,000 plus households. And we did that, we selected these not to be representative, but to really stress test the candidate survey items. So we picked places, very different climates, very different infrastructure, very different problems with water. Fast forward another two years and we had a 12 item scale. And these items are, are 12 questions phrased, how often in the last four weeks have you or anyone in your household at the top worried about water, middle row changed the food that you prepared because of problems with water, gone to sleep without any water, and those responses are weighted from zero for never all the way to often or always if a three, such that the range of the scale is zero to 36 and it takes about three minutes to administer. This week we'll have another paper coming out on a short form that takes only one minute to administer. So the hard work of the scale is done and the fun can begin. We're learning a lot about water and security experiences and how they shape many aspects of life. Those can be broken down into these four pathways. And there's, I won't bore you with the, all of the publications, but basically we're seeing fascinating relationships between, for example, water insecurity and food insecurity. They're strongly related. And we have some of the first panel data showing that water insecurity can actually predict food insecurity. Lots strong relationships with physical health, like resilience to cholera, diarrhea, injuries on the way to fetch water. Probably the strongest data is on how water insecurity is so strongly associated with depression and stress and anxiety. It's a, it's a huge mental burden. Okay, so it's, and HWISE is catching on. A number of agencies are taking it up. For example, IFPRI is using it in an eight country longitudinal survey of how COVID is, is affecting people. And Oxfam has used it to assess really interesting program in, in Sierra Leone and shown a huge impact using the HY scale. Um, so a number of agencies are taking this up, but one of the things that's interesting and useful about the HY scale is that the data are globally comparable. And so we wanted to get globally, globally representative data. And that's where UNESCO and uh, Gallup World Polls come in. So we're partnering together to administer the HYS scale in 
nearly half the world's population. And that data is, are being collected right now. So we have a number of countries in Africa, Brazil, China, India, Middle East, and so forth. And this means that in early 21, 2021, we'll have data on the prevalence of water insecurity. We'll have data on how water insecurity varies by socio-demographics. So we can, exactly, we can see exactly who is left behind by gender, socioeconomic status, urbanicity, age, et cetera. We'll be able to see how water insecurity co-varies with Gallup outcomes. So they're also collecting concurrently food insecurity, stress, happiness. But maybe most germane to some of my colleagues here, we can merge these data with nationally representative data sets on climate, on COVID, on India's comprehensive national nutrition survey. This is exciting. Um, so to just conclude, what are the research and policy opportunities and challenges with this? Well, I see a lot of opportunities. The HY scale is quick to implement. It's high resolution data. It's being collected by Gallup in a nationally representative way. The data are comparable across countries. It's simple to analyze. And there are lots of uses. So you saw the use of prevalence. We can use it also to target resources. We can um, assess the impact of interventions or even natural shocks. It's also really useful for decision makers. Um, at Stockholm World Water Week uh, last month, uh, the British foreign minister discussed how the HY scale was really useful for holding stakeholders accountable. It's even been discussed as possibly a new post SDG target since it's such a, a sister scale to the food insecurity uh, metric that's been so useful. Not without challenges. So HYS is new and the scale was born just last year and it's still relatively unfamiliar. We don't yet have data in high income countries, but um, that's on its way. And we don't yet have funding for repeat measures in, a, in nationally representative surveys, which given how much and how quickly water is changing with climate change, um, that's I think a big missing piece. But because water insecurity uh, experiences are so intuitive and, and there's such a momentum kind of growing for, um, for the, these kind of data, I'm enthusiastic that we will be paying more attention to this indicator in the years to come. And I'll end by encouraging you to please reach out if you're interested in the data or how it can be administered. There's a manual, it's open access. Thank you very much. Thank you to the flash presenters. So we've heard three sort of different perspectives, one on water insecurity, one on citizen science across topics, but also looking at water quality, and then one on water um, ecosystem extent. So now we're gonna move on and try to drill into some of the, some discussion on how these are being applied in different places. Um, and how can we actually take this information and move forward and learn from the experiences that were just shared. And so for this, I'm going to introduce the, the panel and I would like all of the panelists to turn on their uh, cameras, please. And so the first panel member, again, not really in order, is Alexandros uh, and he is the thematic leader of Water for Human Settlements of the Future for UNESCO's Division of Water Sciences. He has more than 25 years of experience in the field of environmental sciences, and he's going to be bringing sort of a, an international organization perspective to the panel. Then we have Marcelo, who is a senior hydrologist at the National Commission on Space Activities in Argentina. And he also is a member of the advisory working group um, under the Commission for Hydrology of, of WMO and has been doing quite a, a lot of work on space applications for measuring water. Then we have uh, Philip, Philip Digo, and he is the technology data and public policy expert. Um, he's the senior director for Africa for the Thunderbird School for Global Management and a technical advisor at the Presidency on Data and Open Governance and a sen senior consultant for UNDP. 
Um, he also previously worked for the Kenyan government, um, and he's also a member of the World Economic Forum, and he was involved in setting up the African Data Cube. So he's going to also bring a perspective on how do you actually mobilize some of this experience in a, a region and a national setting. Then we have Vina, and she is a fellow at the Ashok Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment in Bangalore, and she leads the Water, Land, and Security Program. And so she actually does a lot of work on intersectoral water allocation, impacts of multiple stress around water resources, and ground and surface water linkages. And so this is the pretty amazing panel that we have today. And so to get us started, I'm, I'm just going to start by sort of asking people to reflect on the, the three flash presentations that we've just heard and how we again can take this forward. So Dana, I'm gonna start by asking you the first question, which is, I mean, based on your work, you are trying to work across different sectors on access and quality and availability and, and looking at the linkages with social and health outcomes. Can you tell me some examples from India, from Bangalore, on how you work with local communities to engage them in this water-related data collection and data use process? Sure. Uh, firstly, really excellent set of presentations, uh, both covering kind of observation and citizen science. So that was really enjoyable to listen to. And I think kind of reflects the, the range of citizen engagement that we see in India as well, which includes both mapping. And we saw a lot of this during the Kerala floods of 2018 of real time flood maps being generated. But also, I would like to say counter mapping, because I think I see a lot of uh, very nice on the ground citizen as well as uh, clever uses of uh, Google Earth and um, to kind of explain uh, with very nice visualization problems with government infrastructure projects like uh, embankment breaches uh, showing uh, you know how they're leading to flooding or, or even showing very nice visualizations of digital elevation models showing the problems with interlinking of river projects for example but i think the two projects uh, the, the the two examples i'd like to give you from the ground of citizen science not so much earth observation um, is one of the uh, very interesting companies that we've worked with in Bangalore, the Foundation for Environmental Monitoring, has developed some very nice low-cost smartphone-based sensors. Um, and their sensors work very well for uh, fluoride, for, um, uh, 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 for a variety of uh, E. coli. They just developed an E. coli sensor, uh, which is smartphone-based, as well as for nitrates and phosphates in urban lakes. And we found all of these have worked really well in getting citizens who are already very engaged in Bangalore's uh, and re restoration of Bangalore's lakes and being able to help uh, monitor the health of, uh, of lakes as well as report problems um, to agencies. Uh, as well as engage, I would say, in innovating solutions around lakes and then tracking how nutrient levels have performed over time with, uh, with respect to the, the solutions that they, they've implemented. So I think that's one very good example. The second example I, I think that is worth highlighting and fairly unique is a couple of organizations in India, Aquadam and Chirag uh, notably, um, have developed uh, what they call a cadre of barefoot parageologists, uh, basically trained local communities to map uh, springs as well as to map aquifer and local geology to revive uh, springs that are gradually drying. And I think that this is an, a fairly exciting example of being able to train um, uh, communities, not just to monitor, um, not just to monitor natural resources, but to actually derive meaning and to be able to actually go back and, uh, and rejuvenate and revive springs. So um, I think lots of examples spanning both urban as well as rural and water quality as well as quantity uh, to report on. Thank you, Vina. I think this is um, an excellent example of how we actually get the communities involved in monitoring and in actually using information. Um, I'd like to now go to Marcelo, which, you know, uh, as Vina mentioned, some of the work that they've been doing to get communities engaged. And I know that you have this expertise in using satellite and deriving satellite-based data products for understanding water ecosystems. I'm wondering how, can you or can you share how Argentina has sort of drilled down to use satellite products at the local level to better understand water dynamics? And how do we better link this with some of the 
social type indicators on waterborne disease and access that were just mentioned by Vina and were mentioned in a number of the flash presentations. Thanks for your question, Gillian. Uh, well, indeed, the satellite remote sensing, as you know, has a lot to offer uh, in terms of water and environmental issues in order to understand the, the water dynamics. Hydrology, in general, is one of the disciplines that, that can make the most of satellite formation. And in CONAE, which is our space agency in Argentina, is almost in, in its almost three decades of existence, has devoted a lot of time and energy to develop and improve the, the satellite-based products to better understand the local and regional water dynamics. Uh, keep in mind that we are not just talking about mapping the flat extent or retrieving soil moisture, which are per se very important things. But beyond those two aspects, many other variables that condition the way that the rainfall transforms into runoff within a catchment can be understood from satellites. And for, for instance, the topography and slopes by means of digital elevation models, the land use and land cover, the configuration of the drainage network, the presence of lakes and reservoirs, and so on and so forth. But in all cases, the, the amount of data to be processed can, be, can become substantive, depending on spatial and temporal resolutions and the extent of the geographic domain and the analysis, of course. But I'd like to make a distinction here between those environmental variables that are highly variable in space and time, as the soil moisture, which require systematic monitoring, possibly with high resolutions and, 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 and those that are quasi-static as the relief, for instance, which imply a one-time task for their generation. Uh, the challenge can be of different, uh, of very different orders of magnitude, I would say. Uh, but going back to your question, Gillian, uh, CONAE has a long-standing experience in what is called the landscape epidemiology with satellites. Uh, this field emerges from the understanding that the distribution and abundance of most vectors, hosts, and pathogens are mostly controlled by environmental determinants in the landscape. So macroenvironmental parameters can regulate the population dynamics of species of sanitary interest. This is how it seems natural to find a close relationship between environmental conditions and numerous infectious diseases, including waterborne diseases, of course. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, satellite remote sensing is a powerful tool to monitor the state and evolution of environmental and geophysical parameters. And as such, it can contribute a lot in a wide spectrum of issues pertaining to the SDG 6 and other water-related goals. I only mentioned just a few examples. But we, we saw the, the impressive talk given by, by Luke and Alistair who, who went on these kind of uh, approaches. So. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, I think, I mean, Luke and Alistair did highlight some of the applications of satellites, and you've gone into more detail about some of the applications in terms of all these things that we can do with satellites. Um, from my own perspective, working in this field, it's not quite as easy as we make it sound, where we just say, oh, satellite data is available, and now we're going to use it, and we're going to have all of the answers. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of steps in the middle, and I, I think that Philip actually uh, has, has done a lot of work in this area in the East African context and, and even beyond to actually get people engaged, and, and how do you sort of develop these needs and then build up something like the African data cube, um, because I'm sure there were lots of obstacles and it wasn't as smooth as it might seem from the outside. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, um, Gillian. I think, no, I totally agree. Um, and so I think um, my role previously was, of course, I was deeply embedded in government, but I'm still actually still a technical advisor on, uh, on data and open government. And that is not, um, that's, that's by choice. Uh, and, and I'll connect with Rosie's and Karen's presentation because then we realize that, especially in Africa, you need sort of to have a normative architecture, even without a normative framework, to be able to, to ensure that no one is left behind. Secondly, as you know, we, we neither own satellites <laughs> or, or, or no, we have the capacity to process a lot of this data or no, we have the infrastructure 
uh, you've heard of the petabytes of data. I mean, we still are downloading data in Australia through the data cube. And, and I think for us, we knew that reality. Uh, and so um, it was simply, how do you ensure that you kind of have an agile governance framework that is, is sort of agreed by everybody that then will deliver ultimately at the end of the day an architecture that is more robust. And so the first thing we did, of course, was to understand the role of government and public policy. And so for us, then it was, it was quickly, how do you repurpose an agency that is not siloed? And, and, and when you've had all the presentations that water cuts across, but there's food systems, environment, and a lot of sectors. So how do you ensure that you create an architecture that is, breaks the silos? Which is what we did. So we created a national partnership. Um, secondly, we don't own satellites. So we own satellites, of course, it was uh, Landsat, um, Sentinel, but also NASA. Um, and a couple of shared capacities across the world. So the second piece is how do you quickly inject capacity because there are data gaps now and there's an agency and agency. But then secondly, how do you ensure that that capacity is transferred very quickly so that there's local ownership? And so that's, that was the second piece. That is why we build the Africa Data Cube. It had to be called African Data Cube and not necessarily just a data cube. The third piece was quickly, um, how do you ensure that we have innovation? Because as you know, Africa, we are basically the hotbed of innovation. So how do you ensure that you kind of quickly bring in institutions of learning. So we brought in universities, of course, you, we will work with UGL and the UN uh, in terms of how, how to ensure that then the products that are developed are uh, uh, and connected with citizen science are locally relevant, right? And so, and address local realities. So we, of course, uh, the third piece is potentially, do you even have to create, do you have to create new institutions? And, 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 I, and I think in the Kenyan case, we literally created the space agency in three months. Uh, but in three months, understanding the new realities of, 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 of big data at observations, how it has changed. Of course, Kenya had agreements with Japan, with the, with, with the European Space Agency on satellite, but they never use the data. So how do you ensure that you create that robust ecosystem to be able to move that, but also tied to yes, SDGs, but also national priorities. So I think for us, that was, that was what we did, but the piece that we saw was important was interoperability. And, and that's something that I really want to mention in this conversation. Uh, how do you ensure that data is interoperable? Sometimes it's just not EO data. We even used surveillance data. We even used, um, you know, flyover data from the British, from the Royal Air Force, so that you can layer data before 1971, especially with food systems and water. I think for me, um, and, and so it's not easy. <laughs> and to the extent that how do you simply ensure that you create an enabling environment, you don't step on innovation, create an agile governance framework that you quickly co-create policy as, 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 uh, that, that can actually go um, alongside innovation. Uh, and so that you create an agile framework for that. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I think it's it is really interesting and you mentioned this idea of really ensuring that there's local ownership if we're going to have data use and if we're going to have um, use in policy then you know you do need to build this ownership and so I'm wondering you know obviously I work in a global entity also but I'm going to ask Alexandros from your perspective you know we do need information for global monitoring we also of course need information for national monitoring and for local monitoring. How do you see the role of international organizations in being able to, to ensure that countries are able to form these partnerships and leverage the experiences of each other and so that we can all sort of raise to the level of having the information that we need? Thank you much, Gillian. Uh, I know I'm gonna echo a, a lot of the colleagues who have spoken before. Right. Uh, I'm going to discuss about UNESCO and how UNESCO is upon this whole thing. And uh, UNESCO has a mandate in education, sciences and culture. Right. So uh, we focus mainly on the water sciences uh, and development of these water sciences in order to uh, develop a simple and need to use tools by decision makers. Right. Uh, but these tools should be based on scientific information. Uh, this will ensure the integrity and transparency of the actions. Right? Uh, as Professor Sarah, Sarah Young uh, mentioned before, our role is to establish a science policy interface where the ministers will be able to listen to the latest developments and tools uh, that are available uh, for their use. But also, scientists uh, will listen to the needs of policymakers, right? Because science, uh, for the sake of science, is not really what we want to have. 
right? So that they can orient afterwards the scientific work accordingly. Now, we need to ensure, first of all, that we have a common understanding of concepts and the language used when we're talking about data, right? So uh, at least in our work, we, we, we're trying to establish data collection and analysis related protocols, uh, you know, these protocols, guidelines, whatever you may want to call it, are extremely important, especially in the case of transboundary water bodies, because we're talking about national level, but like you said, imagine now in, in international level, and when we're talking about data and their importance and the importance to be able to talk and understand each other. Uh, and, and this is the case of transboundary uh, rivers or aquifers. So what we're trying to do uh, varies, of course, but uh, we try to improve the quantity, quality, and validation of this water data, uh, uh, establishing a broad collaborative efforts. How we do that? We have the UNESCO Water Family, which has 60 chairs around the globe. We have 36 centers. So we try to have uh, this capacity to support, you know, the, the, the countries that need, require it, right? Uh, so the network is helping uh, whoever is in need. We're trying to enable data accessibility and visibility, uh, try to make them comparable uh, and having usable data series uh, and to be open access, of course. Uh, we want to enhance the development and use of scientific research methods to correct, analyze, complete and interpret the data. Uh, in order to have a better scientific information and of course assisting the dissemination and development of new interpretation methods of the scientific information in a format that it's usable for uh, water education and policy making so the the way that we approach this thing also since we you know we're not a huge organization uh, we have technical capabilities but our reach is is relatively limited so we were focusing on training the trainer. Uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that there is capacity in the countries that we operate uh, in the country. So even when we leave, even when the project or program finishes, at least there is enough capacity in the country to continue. Uh, so that's why we focus on training the trainer. Our first clients will be either the academics, because we know that once we train an academic, he or she will be able to train more specialists in the same country or in region. And then uh, our second group of uh, direct beneficiaries are usually uh, people uh, who work in the ministries uh, related to, to water, because again, they have to take decisions that uh, you know, will matter for most of the citizens in that country. So uh, in order to optimize, let's say, our operations, we try to make sure that this knowledge uh, reaches these people. And this way, they can serve the, the uh, you know, the communities uh, within the counties. So this in a, in a brief effort to, to say what at least UNESCO is doing that. I just want to mention that just like UNESCO, we have a number of other UN agents uh, in the UN family. So UN Environment is working on the environment aspects, FAO, the Food and Agriculture, WMO, uh, on the meteorology and operational hydrology. And since I'm saying, talking about WMO, for example, we have uh, been developing together the glo uh, hydrology glossary. You know, these are elements that you need to have. Uh, WHO does health issues. So we all contribute to this with our own mandates. Thank you for that. Um, I think we're, we're close to time. So what I'm going to ask, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, and I think as we come back to the panelists, what I would ask is if you can sort of answer the questions in the chat, um, if you are able to. And then I'm hoping that what we can do is have sort of everyone who was involved turn their cameras back on and I'll just go around to all of the people in the session and if you can give me your 15 second to 30 second takeaways then that would be great. Um, the questions in the chat relate to uh, examples of where there's citizen science projects that are really up and running on drinking water um, and and how do we actually get more 
people like uh, the ones providing water. So, you know, some of the private sector provisioning companies involved in actually using the data that's produced by government if they're not government run. Um, so, so I'll go, I'll just kind of do a round robin of a 15 second takeaways. And I would also encourage all of the participants who are interested to reach out to people who are involved in the panel. I think all of our contact information is on Attendify if you have specific questions. Um, so, Philip. Um, yes, yeah, so I think in terms of 15 seconds, one, of, of course, uh, we need a multi-stakeholder collaborative framework that also includes a data sharing framework between private sector and government. It's just not government to give data, but also private sector data can actually help um, government data to, put, to have a better picture and provide better services. Thank you, that was great. Nina. I think one of the things that I took away from this was the realization that reporting on SDGs, SDGs is not the same as making progress on SDGs. Uh, a lot of the focus on the big data sets is because we need global and national scale data to report in the SDGs. But I, from my, what I got from Sarah's presentation, that citizen science also plays a really important role in creating an evidence base for what works and what doesn't work. And that's what I would say bottom up or the feedback of what ground level data does. And both of those are separate, but equally important. Thank you. Rosie. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of potentials, really, I, I felt like uh, it's very clear that we are doing, you know, kind of similar things and we all want to get there and I don't understand why we don't manage. <laughs> it's such a big, uh, you know, um, interest and also uh, efforts in the same direction and this is very nice to, to see. Thanks, lots on the partnerships. Marcelo. Well, in 15 seconds, uh, even when I'm from the satellite sector, I, I would say that irrespective of the wealth of satellite sensors and data, we should never disregard the importance of having in situ measurements. This was already mentioned in some other, in, in some of the talks. Uh, they, they don't compete, they complement each other. We need in situ measurements to calibrate and validate satellite products and, and, and some mathematical models that, that run forth with in situ measurements can assimilate satellite products in, a, in a, an excellent uh, example of synergy. So uh, we know that uh, some observing networks are diminishing in number and we, we need to strengthen our efforts for that not to happen. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Alexanders. So let me uh, mute myself. Yeah, my what I, I, I want to give is uh, the data quality and interpretation. Uh, we uh, we have plenty of data. It, that data is like water. Actually. Either we have too much or too little, or you know they they're not uh, of good quality. So if we manage to to get data to that point where uh, you know people will have at least a few platforms, cooperative platforms that they can access and have confidence in what they're using. Uh, this will also attract the private sector that you were talking about, but also uh, it will uh, help develop a lot of tools that will uh, afterwards help people uh, to understand better things and uh, decision makers make uh, more sound decisions. Okay, Sarah. Thanks. Problems with water can be invisible and we're all figuring out how to make them more visible. Um, we're most powerful when we're understanding each other's languages and I'm glad we all see the complementarity of our different measurements. Now we just need to get all together and um, find the one platform that solves all the problems. Thank you. Alistair. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so really, just reflect it. Just, just um, um, similar to similar to what to what, what the other speakers have said. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for data science to uh, make use of um, a lot more than sort of citizen science data um, to, to you know to, to to help with that with that problem of of needing in situ um, data to to improve methods. So I think that's a real complementarity and and uh, you know between between the different kind of areas that have been have been talked about today. 
Thanks, Luca. Yes, in my case, I want to stress uh, the, the fact that uh, of the complementarity, I agree with uh, Marcelo and uh, Alistair. Uh, we have seen a lot of cases and examples, especially the teaching from uh, science uh, data are very interesting uh, to use. And uh, moreover, I want to stress the fact that uh, what is really important, especially for the new technologies, satellite images, big data, and so on, is to uh, train people to, yes, yeah, in order to improve uh, the capacity for, uh, of, uh, of each country. I think it's uh, really important. Thanks. And Karen, back to the beginning for the final 15 seconds. All of your comments are really inspiring. I would also simply add the need to think big, the need to think big about transformative mechanisms, not only for monitoring, but for preventing environmental harm and, and, and damage to water ecosystems and for enforcing. We have the power to do real time regulation and enforcement in a very spatially and temporally flexible way. Let's use it. Thank you. I. Agree. I think, you know, we, we definitely are on the right track. Um, we are, have made heaps of progress already. And so I think that, you know, with the partnerships that are suggested and putting together these sorts of frameworks, we will be in a whole different situation likely in 10 years. So with that, I'm going to conclude, but I wonder if Kiki and Aaron might want to turn their cameras on because uh, for those of you who are joining us today, they have done heaps of the work um, in terms of pulling this together, especially Kiki. So as we're concluding, I would just like to thank her from all of us that were involved in the session. Um, and until next time, I think that is farewell. Bye. Thank you.